Welcome, One Logo World Live, the Kenyon McDuffie Go-Go Election Special here. Thank you guys for joining us. I know it's been a long time, but we are back, and we have the pleasure of having the Ward 5 Council Member, who is running for at-large council member. I have that correct, right? You got it correct. Right. That's what's up. Thank you, man. Kenyon McDuffie. Um, thank you so much. I think this is so fitting for us to have you here. Uh, because first, you're a native Washingtonian who understands the go-go culture, but all culture, but also as being the council member that spearheaded something that a lot of people thought was already in existence probably, um, but uh, being the person who often chaired the uh, initiative to make go-go the official music. Um, I guess my first question would be, were you surprised that it was already not, or were you surprised that it had never been brought up before? You know what? I wasn't really surprised given how people in my position back in the day used to perceive and treat go-go music. Mm -hmm. You think about it when we were growing up, uh, it wasn't embraced in the same way uh, then uh, that it's embraced today. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a credit and testament to um, you know some of the more recent activity that's transpired over the last uh, you know, three to four years. When we were growing up, um, there were a lot of folks who really associated go-go with negative things. Right, violence. Yeah, with violence, with, you know, all types of uh, activities that aren't wholesome and aren't about peace and love right. and about culture and right. about, you know, really, you know, trying to make money in, in a way that you can take care of yourself and your family. Absolutely. People don't talk about the ecosystem. Right. Small business the economics, the economics that come, that come along. Yeah, because it's so many things that, that people don't understand. There are security firms that uh, live off it. There are bartenders. There are uh, shuttling companies. There are sound companies. There are equipment technicians. Uh, you know, it's such an industry that most people have not um, really fully got to the depths of it. Um, but I think the other thing that should be noted about you is the fact that you put public policy behind it mm -hmm. and funding as well. Could you just elaborate? You yeah, know sure. what I mean? Uh, because um, I think you did something that I, I don't know if it's always emphasized the fact that uh, during the pandemic, you initiated a bill that was able to pay a lot of go-go musicians uh, with stimulus checks. Uh, that. Could you elaborate about yeah, that yeah, yeah. and also elaborate why you thought that was important? Absolutely. Um, so, first of all, I mean, making go-go the official music of the Disco of Columbia, it was really prompted by the movement that the people created. Right. When they wanted to shut down, you know, the music and what Donald was doing at 7th and Florida Avenue. Right. Uh, people said no. They said, don't mute Go-Go. They said, um, you're not going to shut us down. And they showed up. They showed out. And, and they really exposed, I think, the world mm -hmm. uh, to what Go-Go means to the District of Columbia, much in the way that jazz is New Orleans and, country is to national. And it's so amazing because BET ended up having a whole award ceremony called Don't Mute DC. Absolutely. So that is so fitting because maybe in context we don't understand that it did actually go to the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, when the pandemic struck, uh, obviously a lot of industries were, were hurt by that. And, mm -hmm. You know, people were hurt and lost their lives. So there was a, a physical aspect to the pandemic, but there was also an economic aspect right. to the pandemic where a lot of businesses were shut down and the venues were shut down. Right. People couldn't perform. People couldn't earn money. They right. couldn't take care of themselves and their family. Right. And so I offered a $100 million business grants program that would address a lot of the things that were happening in hospitality, tourism, leisure, restaurants. Right. Uh, and I don't want to leave GoGo behind. And so right. we put millions of dollars behind uh, a GoGo initiative to make sure that uh, the folks in our GoGo economy would get the resources that they needed as well to help try to get them through the pandemic. Right. Much in the way we were helping other small businesses get through the pandemic. Uh, being a D.C. native, understanding what GoGo means to me and our local economy, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that they were at the table too to be able to be on the receiving end of some of those resources that we were putting uh, into our local economy to support individuals and families and entrepreneurs to help them get through the pandemic. And so we put about $3 million in. Um, but we also made it, you know, uh, an aspect where we put money in the D.C. library as well. Right. And archives. Absolutely. Um, to really start to protect uh, and really lift up GoGo to its rightful place in the District of Columbia. Absolutely. And also expanding it to literature, which is not always, because I think one of the issues that we may have had in the beginning, that was not always documented. And the fact that you're putting funding in to document the culture in its historical context, it means a lot more. And maybe we not we don't always see that on the surface or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I, if nobody else says thank you on behalf of most global musicians, let me just thank you for I thinking about us doing, doing the pandemic. But you know what, though? If you sit in the position that I do, uh, privileged to represent, you know, 
the, the city that helped to raise me. Absolutely. Uh, and you understand the significance, the cultural significance, the economic significance right. of Dogo. Uh, you don't have to thank me, Biggie. You know what I mean? It's my mm-hmm. duty to do these types of things, right? So people should expect it mm-hmm. from people in my position. If you're not getting it, um, then you should be looking to, you know, elect new people, frankly. Uh, that's my take on it. Well, I appreciate that. But as you know, sometimes everybody don't know the significance of prioritizing that. That's true. And that's what I think you should be uh, thankful for is because you made that a high priority yeah. as well. And as we know in Google Music, that's not always the case. Yeah. So you should be thankful for that. Now, for those who do not know, Kenya McDuffie is running for at-large council member. And we're going to get this going now. There, you're allowed to have two votes. And I don't know yes. if that's really um, uh, emphasized. So... For everybody who do not know, you're allowed two votes for at large council member. So even if you have somebody or you're thinking, you can vote for Kenya McDuffie and, and another candidate yeah, as well. Sure. Um, so one go go world live right here. So I guess since we are talking about go go music, whatever, what is your favorite band? What is, what is your favorite go go band of all time? Man, I never answered that with one one answer, man. Are you kidding me? Oh, uh, I, look, you know, I've been listening to go go as long as I can remember. I mean, it's it's part of you know growing up. I mean, my, my dad had like trouble funk. Albums. We had right. Chuck Brown albums, right? right? For me, you know, growing up, it was like Fat, Jump, mm-hmm. Essence, J. I mean, uh, we also had, you know, E. Mm-hmm. So I love all the Go Go. Right. I embrace it, and you know, even with some of the more recent Bounce Beat right. um, uh, bands, I appreciate it all, man, and what they contribute to to the Disco Plumbing. So I never really say there's one band, mm-hmm. uh, so much as it is an appreciation that I have for the genre and, and what people. Um, have demonstrated with their artistic ability right. um, to be able to put Gogo on a world stage uh, and really draw, I think, positive attention to the District of Columbia and what we're able to do here in the nation's capital. I think a lot of people look at New York, they look at all these other cities right. for their music prowess, uh, and, and, and Gogo doesn't necessarily get uh, its rightful seat. Uh, I think we're starting to see that change. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that, and I want to be able to support and embrace that. Well, I think on that note, then we're going to go to. I, how about this? We're going to go to some backyard band. Okay. That amazing day against Tony Lewis. There was an amazing rally that we did for Tony Lewis Sr. Yeah. or whatever. And we're going to cut to some footage. We have the amazing council member of War 5, soon to be the at-large council member, Kenya McDuffie, right here on One Go Go World Live. We'll be back in a few minutes. Everything that we do, hey, you got a bad 
next thing Say she recognize her She says she wanna roll with the BYB Tell me that she love everything that we do Kenyon McDuffie invested in the future of our homegrown culture. He led the charge to establish DC natives to proclaim go-go music as DC's official music. Kenya also provided critical funding for go-go musicians during the pandemic. We need to be sure that our local artists and culture aren't left behind and can continue to thrive. Kenyon is fighting to make that happen. On November the 8th, vote Kenyon McDuffie for at large. Welcome back to One Go Go World Live, the Kenya McDuffie election go go special here. Uh, we have the Honorable Kenya McDuffie here, Ward 5 Council Member, soon to be the at large council member. Uh, one of the things that I was really excited about having this conversation, uh, we talk about this a lot, is that a lot of people do not necessarily know your journey growing up as a DC native. Could, could you just explain to them what your life was growing up uh, as a DCPS student, yeah. uh, just growing up in, in the area that you grew up in? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in the 1980s and 1990s, mm -hmm. and it was a time frame where the District of Columbia was experiencing some of its toughest, you know, times, frankly. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a crack epidemic right. that rocked our entire city. My neighborhood is called Stronghold. It's technically a part of Edgewood. Um, but it, it was a blue-collar, close-knit, small neighborhood mm -hmm. of people who, for generations, uh, lived in that community. So everybody knew each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once the crack epidemic hit, you had open-air drug markets, you had young black uh, males and females, frankly, um, who were rocked by it. I mean, people's parents mm -hmm. who had jobs, lost their jobs, right. who suffered from addiction. People were having babies at a really early age. People were losing their lives. People were dropping out of high school, going off to prison. Uh, and so it was that, at that time frame where mass incarceration was really uh, taking hold in the city as well. And I grew up uh, and came of age on that time period. And so I, I'm a lawyer today, you know, former DOJ civil rights attorney. I used to work for Eleanor Holmes Norton. And a lot of people know that about my story, know that I'm a council member. Uh, but they don't know that, you know, I grew up here. And when I graduated from Wilson, right. uh, Jackson Reed, uh, not only did I not attend college right away, I didn't apply to a single college. Why is that, you think? I mean, for somebody that, you know, obviously it was a lot going on, but as because people would be surprised at the council member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, what in your time made you not initially apply for college? Because I have two older brothers. I have a younger sister, too, but my two older brothers had both gone to college. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got into 12th grade, they were no longer in college. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, like a lot of young black males during that time frame trying to figure out their way and how to navigate. And what was your turning point? If you don't well, mind for me, it was it was watching them, right? Watching them do things that were positive, also watching them do things where they made mistakes and trying to learn and trying to replicate the mistakes that they made. But for me, you know, I tried to to, to get a job, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I couldn't get a job. I took the civil service test with some of the homies from the hood. Nobody got a call back. And I made a lot of bad choices, like a lot of the young folks in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, where the economic opportunities weren't flowing to us. Right. Right? We wanted to get that good government job. 
get those benefits, and right. yet we couldn't. Right. And so we did what a lot of folks in the neighborhood did. Um, and for me, the turning point was uh, after trying to go to UDC twice and dropping out promptly, um, it was the opportunity in the form of a offer of employment from the United States Postal Service. And wow. So I carry mail. So, so that's interesting because people may not necessarily know that you have the All American story. So you were a postman yeah. at one time. What did you think was your future was going to be when you was in that state? Well, I mean, initially when I got the job, it was like, okay, I'm set. I'm going to work, you know, for you know however long it takes to get the retirement, get the pension, and I'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. um, but what I learned quickly was how my financial security, economic security, started to differentiate me from my peers, right. right? Like I said, there were a lot of young folks in my neighborhood who were dropping out of high school, going off to prison, hustling, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, dying mm -hmm. in the neighborhood, and yet here I was starting to do well for myself, right? But then I started to look around every morning I had to go to work, I had to walk through the hood and see what was happening around me. With there were still people suffering, right. you know what I mean? I was seeing parts of the city and up in Northwest, like Lockville Road, like MacArthur Boulevard, wow. these big houses with indoor pools, that I had never seen before. Being right? a D.C. native. Being a D.C. native. Right. Going to Wilson. Right. And yet I hadn't seen wow. what life was like, you know, across the other side of Wisconsin right. Avenue until I was in my 20s. And it started to show me, you know, the disparities that exist between the right. District of Columbia. You can live in the same city with people and yet be worlds apart. Wow. And I started to realize that. And I started to realize that my fate and my success wasn't going to be about how much money I could make at the Postal Service or just being in security of having a government job. Right. It was going to be my ability to improve the lives of people suffering around me. Right. And that's when I started to, you know, really think about my life a little differently, my neighborhood a little differently. And, then, and really the light bulb moment for me happened amid some tragedy. Um, I lost two of my friends to gun violence in the span of about 52 days in the spring of 1998. Mm -hmm. And it rocked me in a way that the other losses didn't, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, growing up, a lot of people died in the neighborhood, and I hate to say it as if I'm normalizing right, it, right. but growing up, we were just trying to make it to our 18th birthday, right. so it wasn't it wasn't novel when somebody died. I mean, you, you got used to hearing the gunshots. You got right. used to seeing the yellow tape and the blood in the streets, uh, and it hardened us in a certain yeah. way. But when I lost those two, um, it made me rethink, you know, my purpose right. in life, and I... I How mean, old were you at the time, if you don't mind asking? I was... Going on 23 years, 23 old, years old, and and it made me say, what more to life is there? And and my mom had already stayed on my case and wanted me to do something different. I had a mentor who grew up from the, across the alley from me, who went from high school at Carroll to Harvard, mm -hmm. undergrad, got a master's at the University of London, and then went to Harvard Law School. And yet, every summer, every opportunity he got to come home during holidays, he would always be in my ear. And he was older. He was with my brothers, my two older brothers, really, and I was cool with his siblings, his younger siblings. But he always stayed on my case and, and just really encouraged me. And then I met the woman of my dreams uh, who... That'll do it for you. That, that'll do it. And she was focused. And, and all those things culminated in me saying, okay, Kenyon, you're at a crossroads mm -hmm. right now. And I decided to resign from the Postal Service despite a lot of people in my neighborhood saying, don't do it. This, is, this would be the biggest mistake you ever made. Wow. Why would you resign from the Postal Service when you got the job everybody wants? Why would you resign from the Postal Service to go back to college, UDC, when you've already done it twice and failed? Mm -hmm. uh, but I took a leap of faith, went back to UDC for the third time, did real well, transferred over to Howard, ended up graduating the top 5% of my class with a degree in political science, community development, worked for Eleanor Holmes Norton, went back to law school, University of Maryland, and it put me on the trajectory. And became president of my civic association mm -hmm. and started, you know, really doing the work. Is that, really is that where the political light bulbs uh, came yeah, on? Absolutely. Is it, yeah. absolutely. Could you elaborate what that is? Because I yeah. think sometimes we hear civic and it's like a generic word or whatever. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? So when I was at UBC and Howard, you know, I started to realize the impact of the leadership in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I started to attend civic association meetings. And there was a bunch of senior citizens at Stronghold at the time who were really doing it. Mm -hmm. And they were doing like potlucks trying to raise money or, or trips to Atlantic City mm -hmm. to try to raise money. Uh, and me and a buddy of mine uh, uh, started to organize around the community. Uh, and uh, Justin Fairfax is his name. It was actually Roger Fairfax's younger brother. Right. But, you know, it was that civic activism that showed me how government started to work and how you get things done, mm -hmm. you know, working with government. And all the folks who I was interacting with, my council member was Vincent Arnold. She was a lawyer. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton was the congresswoman who I worked for. She was a lawyer. Wow. The mayor at the time was Anthony Williams. He was a lawyer. And so I started to see how 
government work and how you push the right buttons to get things done in your community and how, frankly, it was inequitable in terms of what some communities got versus what others that were less organized got. And, and I started to figure out um, you know, the best way to bring about the resources and get those things in my neighborhood and start to understand how politics work and the value of uh, public service uh, as a mechanism to garner the tools and resources to empower communities and people. Wow, that's amazing because this, you know, the story has been so many layers, but just to live in a neighborhood that you grew up in, two friends died at 23 to get here is such an all-American story. And that was one of the things I think people would not know, you know, like we see this council member, but I think it's great that people are really learning your story yeah. because your story is a lot of young African-American men in Washington, D.C. right now going on. Uh, we have the Honorable Kenya McDuffie here, Ward 5 council member who is running for council member at large, you do get two votes. And we got to make sure votes. we emphasize that. Pick that two. Know, uh, pick two, you know what I mean? So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to, uh, you, know, I'm, you know I'm in a new band right now. Yeah. I don't know. Raheem Devon and the Craig Crusaders. Uh, we do have a new single coming out called Penny With a Hole In It, and it's a remake of the Dion Ferris song. So we're going to go to Penny With a Hole In It. We still have the Honorable Kenya McDuffie here, One Go Go World Live, Kenya McDuffie Election Special. Thank you. We'll be back in a few minutes.
everyone, I'm Jessica Smith and I'd like to thank Councilmember McDuffie for joining Eric and I today. And I'd like to start about your REACH Act policy, your racial equity achieves um, results. So in the description of the policy, it says that Chapter 3, Title 47 of the District Official Code requires the Office of Racial Equity to sort of collab with the Office of the Administrator to create racial equity tools to aid in racial disparities in a, a district. So could you explain to us what these um, tools are and how much rigor did it take to enact a policy like and this? That's a great question, Jessica. I appreciate you asking me that question. And I appreciate you saying the whole name of the bill, too. I like to sometimes uh, create acronyms just to make it more memorable for folks, but uh, it's the REACH Act for short. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, it stands for the Racial Equity Change Results Act. And the whole point of it was to introduce equity into everything that our government does, both the executive branch, the mayor, and all the agencies under her purview, as well as uh, the Council of the District of Columbia. Uh, so it created the Council's Office on Racial Equity. It also created a similar office under the executive. And the idea is that you look at the District of Columbia and all the inequities that exist, across every indicator for success, whether it is education, health, uh, employment, wealth, uh, all those things, you'll see that black folks are on the lowest end of the socioeconomic totem pole. And the idea is that when we create policies, we create laws, we should be measuring the impact that it has on the least among us, right? And so now, when certain bills are created at the council, uh, they get scored using a racial equity impact assessment uh, that gives people an idea about whether it's going to exacerbate certain inequities that exist or if it's going to make things better. And I think we all should know that uh, when we think about how far we've come, but also just how stark the gaps are that exist in our city and how the government, because of the historic issues that we face, racism, you know, segregation, and a host of inequitable policies, uh, the government needs to be intentional about the laws and policies, regulations we're putting in place to close those gaps. And that's really the premise of the bill. Um, there's a bunch of different provisions within it, but they're all designed to make sure that we are uh, looking at our work and making our city more racially equitable, more socially just, and more economically inclusive. Yeah, that's amazing. And I have a follow-up question for that because, well, we see that most of our D.C. leaders are black and brown people, but do acts and policies like that also in our demographic of a city where it's a lot of black people and a lot of black leaders, does it also put the people who are considered the majority, so white people, on the same level to try to bring that representation? That's a great question. Um, and. You know, what I'll say to that is that it is REACH Act and it's, it's racial equity achieves results, not racial equality 
right? Because I think there's a difference between equality and equity, right? We're not talking about giving everybody the same thing, right? Because there are certain people, certain families, certain uh, races that have had um, advantage, quite frankly. Uh, and then there are certain races, particularly black folks, who have been disadvantaged, right? Through no fault of our own, right? We're talking about policies that have been in place longer than any of us have been born, uh, but the results we're still living with today, which is why when you look at the racial wealth gap that exists in the District of Columbia, mm -hmm. it's so wide, right? We're talking about the median wealth of a white family in the District of Columbia is 81 times that of black median wealth. $284,000 versus $3,500, right? That didn't occur by happenstance. It's a result of generations of policies designed to keep black people from uh, experiencing wealth building opportunities, right? We couldn't buy homes in the District of Columbia decades ago. In fact, the homes that I live in that my grandparents bought back in 1952 has a racially restrictive covenant on it that was placed on it uh, back in the 1940s when a group of neighbors uh, in that Bloomingdale section of our city decided that they didn't want to sell homes to black people, right? My grandparents and the generation that they were a part of really pushed through some of those things, and it's up to us, it's up to me, it's up to you all uh, to make sure that we are, are using the tools of government to keep pushing the needle forward and making sure that the resources are getting to the people most in need. That's what equity looks like. It's giving everybody what they need to thrive. It's not pitting Ward 3 mm -hmm. against Ward 8 mm -hmm. and saying that you get something and you don't. What it's saying is, if we're deliberate and intentional about how we make policy in the District of Columbia, we can make our economy grow in a way that everybody gets what they need. We're talking about a $20 billion uh, budget here in the District of Columbia. We think that we should be able to do uh, what we need to do to make sure that folks throughout the District of Columbia, regardless of their circumstances, regardless of their race, regardless of who they love, uh, should be able to get everything they need to thrive. Mm. So, um, in the spectrum of thriving, another issue in D.C. is our environment. Mm -hmm. And I know in 2015 you passed your War 5 um, spray. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah your good. spray booth um, moratorium. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, so what was it that pushed you to I mean, passing something like that, especially in 2015. I mean, we've seen our statistics and data later, and we're in much more trouble. So was it some? Was it a matter of prevention, or were you, I guess, um, sort of making up for the damage that was already done? That's an excellent question. Um, I think it's both and. Mm -hmm. I think it was a matter of looking at the past and the damage that has accrued to communities of color mm -hmm. in neighborhoods like Brentwood, Ivy City, where um, you know, the majority of the District of Columbia's industrial land is concentrated in one part of the city, in Ward 5, mm -hmm. right? And the people who live around those communities where the industrial land is are the ones who are bearing the brunt of the environmental injustices that flow from those outdated policies, again, that happened decades ago, but are still impacting communities today, where you have uh, the yellow Aussie buses that are picking people up and taking them to school and, and guzzling gas and emitting greenhouse gases. Well, they're parked largely in parking lots around uh, you know, black and brown communities in Ward 5. When you think about the salt domes, the concrete plants, when you think about the trash transfer stations, well, um, they're not in Ward 3 and Upper Northwest, right? They're, they're long the railroad tracks and industrial areas that are located in Ward 5, and I legislated that bill and other bills establishing an industrial land transformation task force so that the city can rethink how we make policy and how environmental policy impacts people in communities of color who have been marginalized to a certain extent and have higher concentrations of, you know, uh, health ailments like, um, you know, uh, obesity, type 2, uh, diabetes, you think about heart disease, you think about all those ailments, uh, and the higher percentages represented in communities of color, and you think about the old, outdated environmental policies that have concentrated those activities in certain communities, then we got to change it. Yeah. 
And I'm glad that I actually saw something like that put in place and specifically for a certain ward because every ward is so different, especially in their stages of construction. And as a DC resident and just someone who is observant of my community, I've seen more and more construction like when you're on 395 and you have a whole highway and then there's buildings and I feel like how is that you know a livable condition and then I read this study that says that DC's main pollutant is called um, a particulate matter of mm -hmm. 2.5 mm -hmm. and it's actually very fine matter that can you know go into your respiratory tract and although we have sites that are favorable to DC and I guess our administration that say we have good air quality but truly uh, I've also read a study that says that we have you know, a higher concentration than WHO standards. Mm -hmm. So in order, I know, in the concept of modernizing, how do we keep people safe? That's a great question. You all are, are doing, I mean, this is a phenomenal question. Um, and I didn't even mention the paint spray booth because that's, it was your initial question, but the idea was, you know, where a lot of the cars are being painted, they're in these industrial um, facilities near residential areas. And, and the spray paint is emanating beyond the confines of the industrial building where it's taking place into the residential neighborhoods and those particular matters are being uh, are, are going over into those residential areas and people are consuming them right and so in terms of keeping people safe you've got to put in place uh, policies that create buffers that protect people against those types of things you think about um, a lot of the highways and byways and streets and, and just in terms of the way that things have been constructed you know, 395, 695, 295, Route 50. Uh, a lot of that stuff was constructed uh, on the eastern side of the District of Columbia um, through northeast and southeast. You think about the way that our city uh, has been zoned, and a lot of the multifamily is in, you know, the eastern side of the District of Columbia. A lot of the single-family homes are in Upper Northwest. Um, a lot of that stuff has its roots deep in policies that were made a long time ago that haven't been changed. And that's why we need elected leaders who are going to be bold, who are going to be intentional, who are going to understand the depths that we have to come from in order to address existing uh, issues that exist today, uh, where minorities have largely uh, been negatively impacted by some of the laws that have been on the books for a really long time. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you, Mr. McDuffie, for uh, coming and speaking up, speaking to these uh, us young journalists and us young aspiring journalists. Um, I want to go back to the racial uh, wealth gap uh, that you mentioned earlier when you were speaking with the Jessica. You started the Baby Bonds Act, where you gave uh, one thousand dollars a year to people who are under to children who are under the three hundred percent wealth gap. Yeah. So. During research, I was wondering, is there any financial literacy or different courses that come with that? And alongside that, I just want to know, is that $18,000, when they give when they're 18, is that ever going to increase? Are we ever going to increase that amount from $1,000 a year to something else? I'm just speaking, uh, when it, I want my children to benefit from it. And looking at the economy, my children is not going to benefit from $18,000 a year. All right. So it's a great question. Uh, and the idea behind the baby bonds bill, which is technically called the Child Wealth Building Act, mm -hmm. uh, was that racial wealth gap that I talked about. You got kids who are born into a cycle of poverty within their family, generations of poverty in the district economy that seems inescapable for some people. Mm -hmm. And so what this bill does was uh, say that if you are uh, a baby born into uh, a family making up to 300% of the federal poverty level, then you get an account created, mm -hmm. right? Just by being poor in the District of Columbia, uh, you get that account created, and we get up to $1,000 a year in an interest-bearing account, such that uh, when you turn 18 years old, uh, you get 18 or 20 or $25,000 uh, or whatever the amount is in the account for you to do things like further your education, whether it's traditional college or taking up a trade or getting a certification in IT, uh, or it's you know uh, putting money on, down on a home or some other type of wealth building activities that certain families have been doing for generations because they've built wealth over the years. And so uh, the amount that goes into the account is actually tied to CPI, to the Consumer Price Index, so that it goes up. Uh, with the increase in the CPI mm -hmm. over the years. And so it's not designed to stay just at $1,000. It is designed to increase mm -hmm. with the local economy and the CPI. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What is the relationship with the baby bonds and um, 
taxpayer dollars of paying taxes? Uh, it, I identify with the support of my colleagues $32 million mm -hmm. to fund the baby bonds bill. And so uh, it's going to fund it uh, year after year after year. Unless somebody changes the law, it's going to be there on the books in perpetuity. Um, also, I was wondering, um, you started the East of the River uh, Youth Work Development Program, which helps uh, it's youth from 18 to 24, correct? Yeah. 18 to 24, uh, with just job development and uh, those type of skills so they can get out in the workforce. Yeah. However, with the new rate of teenagers and young people killing each other, especially on that side of town, have we ever thought, or have you and your team ever thought about extending that age from maybe high schoolers? Because uh, youth technically starts from, I believe, 13 to 14, mm -hmm. and it goes to 24. So have we ever thought about extending it from high schoolers uh, to 24-year-olds? So by the time people get out of high school, they already have that work experience, and they can just jump out into the workforce. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, and there are a number of policies and programs that we have in place that mm -hmm. are designed to support young folks, like our Summer Youth Employment Program. Mm -hmm. And I've supported uh, over the years, the expansion of the age of the SYEP program. And I was also young, I participated in the Mayor's Youth Leadership Institute, uh, where I learned, you know, things that are so important that I carry with me today, like uh, conflict resolution, um, where I learned, you know, some of the skills about how to uh, manage money and things like that. I learned about our city and the different mm -hmm. wards. Uh, and so there are a number of programs, in addition to the one that I funded um, to, to help young folks throughout the District of Columbia. And I think it's important that it not being either or, mm -hmm. right? That program addresses young folks, uh, you know, 18 to 24. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have a myriad of programs designed to support young folks and give them the intensive uh, services, resources, supports that they need so that they can grow and be safe and thrive uh, and make money to the extent that they need that to support themselves and their families. So just again, uh, my name is Eric Crater III. This is Jessica Smith. We want to thank uh, Mr. Kenny McDuffie again for coming and speaking to us over here at uh, One Go Go World and we just wanted to say thank you all for watching and we hope to see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Jessica. Oh, thank you One Go Go thank World. You. <laughs> Kenny McDuffie invested in the future of our homegrown culture. He led the charge to establish DC natives to proclaim Go Go music as DC's official music. Kenya also provided critical funding for Go Go musicians during the pandemic. We need to be sure that our local artists and culture aren't left behind and can continue to thrive. Kenyon is fighting to make that happen. On November the 8th, vote Kenyon McDuffie for At Large. One Go Go World Live. Once again, thank you guys again. The Honorable Kenyon McDuffie, War 5 Council Member, who's running for At Large Council Member. Please remember this Tuesday, November the 8th, you get two votes, right? Pick two. Pick two. Pick two, Kenyon McDuffie for At Large Council Member. Thank you guys again. Thank you, Kenyon McDuffie. Thank you to the amazing students at Dean Wood Radio Broadcast Program. I hope they made an impression on you. Are you kidding me? Indelible impression. I really appreciate y'all. Well, like, excellent job. I appreciate it. And before we go, best of luck, my brother. Bro. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And we're rooting for you. We love you and we appreciate you. Man. Appreciate y'all. Absolutely. Two votes November 8th. Me too. Kenyon McDuffie. One go go world live. Thank you guys. The stars at night, sometimes it's so overwhelming. I try, but I can't help it. If I wanted to.